Welcome to Witchlit, a place to talk about the craft of writing and writing the craft. I'm your host, Victoria Rashke, author, publisher, witch, and nosy Scorpio. Witchlit is brought to you by Thousand Volt Press, a family-owned independent publisher established to produce the books we want to see in the world. Titles including Changing Past by Vaughn Abero, Conjuring the Commonplace by Lane Fuller and Corey Thomas Hutchison, and my latest book, Verona Green, can be purchased directly from thousandvoltpress.com or wherever you buy books. Emperor Forge is a Gardnerian high priest, an initiate of the Minoan Brotherhood, a Discordian Episcopos, a recovering alcoholic, and a notary public from Houston, Texas. His book is Virgo Witch, Divining the Details, co-authored with Evo Dominguez Jr., um, out from Llewellyn Publications in November 2023. By day, he manages a leather and fetish wear shop, and by night, he dabbles in chaos magic, offers geomantic and lithomantic readings, and blogs irreverently. His essays have previously appeared in The Gorgon's Guide to Magical Resistance, out from Revelor Press 2022, and Modern Witchcraft with the Greek Gods, History, Insights, and Magical Practice, um, out from Llewellyn as well in 2022. So, Thumper Forge, welcome to Witchlit. Thank you. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I'm excited to have you on. I've followed your writing for a while at Patheos Pagan, and just you are... Uh, uh, a name that's hard to miss in the occultosphere, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so our first question for everybody on the show, just to kind of break the ice is, you know, why, why write books? Why still write? You know, I, I did not start out with the attention of writing books. I have, I have always written and I've blogged for many years in one medium or another and uh, I several years ago, I started blogging for Patheos Pagan. And at the time, I was like, OK, this is it. This is <laughs> this is my only venue. And I'm just going to stay here forever and be perfectly happy. And I wrote a blog post about um, a book that Storm Fairy Wolf had written mm -hmm. uh, that was called The Satyr's Kiss. Yes. And it was all about, you know, queer magic and gay men. And I wrote a parody review of it where I said that I thought it was supposed to be Narnia slash fiction. And so it was, it was a very irreverent review. And it, and I was like, hopefully people will think this is funny. And I got a message from storm that just said, my editor would like to speak with you. And so I was like, Oh, I just got blacklisted. Okay. Note to self, no more reviews, uh -oh. but it turned out they were looking for authors for the uh, upcoming sun sign series. And so they asked, uh, they wanted to know what my sign was, and they asked if I would be interested in co-authoring the book Virgo Witch. And so it kind of went from there. Oh, wow. Well, cool. It's funny how that, that happens. I swear, I think there's like a whole, you know, anyone who wants to write witchy books, like apparently you just have to be standing in the right place at the right time. Absolutely. Or, it seems or like say the wrong thing at the right time. Is maybe, sometimes what happens. maybe that's true. Um, so before being asked to write Virgo Witch, did you think of yourself that way? Or was it just kind of what happened with the book series? Did I think of myself as a Virgo Witch? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I did. I, um, I, for years, I did not really identify with my sun sign. Mm -hmm. I, I knew what the Virgo stereotypes were. And I just really didn't feel like I matched up to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a boss one time years ago who was very into astrology. And I just made a comment about, you know, I'm supposed to be a Virgo, but Virgos are supposed to be neat and clean and tidy. And I'm none of these things. And she said, well, do you have a desk at home? And I said, well, yeah. And she said, does every, do you just put anything anywhere? Or does everything have a place? And I said, well, everything has a place. And she said, what happens if one thing gets out of place? And I said, well, then it's ruined. And it doesn't matter <laughs> where I put anything and she said, that's because you're a Virgo. And so I, that was sort of my introduction to astrology and where I, um, I just started kind of identifying more as a Virgo. And as my witchcraft practice grew, that always sort of like loomed alongside of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why I live with two Virgos. My partner and my son are both Virgos and, um, they are both like stereotypical of Virgos. Yes. So, but um yeah <laughs> i think all virgos are stereotypical virgos but we don't like the idea of stereotypes so we we rail against them but then by railing against them we just reinforce the stereotypes even yeah. more all that we joke uh my husband is on the cusp of leo mm -hmm. you know august 23rd so he's right on the cusp but 
I always joke that he, he he has to do it perfectly and you also have to tell him his hair look nice and his looks nice while he does it. Um, just because he's got some of those Leo tendencies too. Yes. <laughs> so, but I don't know. I'm always fascinated by it. Like, you know, part of my, my inner skeptic is like, does it really matter? And then I think about like, I'm a double Scorpio mm-hmm. and people are often shocked by that because I don't, I guess, present as a double Scorpio, but my rising sign is Taurus. Mm-hmm. And I do present as a Taurus. That was like, hmm, yeah, maybe there's something to it. Well, the the that's something I think people don't, and it was something that I kind of learned in the process of writing the book because astrology has never really been my my strong suit. But you know, we think of our sun signs as sort of this is who I am and this is how everybody mm-hmm. sees me, but it's the rising sign that's how other people tend to see us where our sun sign is our core and our moon sign is what we kind of hide from everybody else. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense that you're a double Scorpio, but nobody realizes you're a Scorpio. Right. (laughs) Exactly. It's like, you're too nice to be a Scorpio. Scorpios (laughs) are not all evil. That's not, that is the wrong stereotype. We're not all evil. I like Scorpios. We do expect loyalty. We do expect loyalty. That's why Scorpios and Virgos get along because we all have, we have very high expectations just in different yes. areas. Yes, exactly. I do think that, I mean, cause I had a friend who was like, Oh, Virgo, Scorpio, it's a bad combo. And I was like, why? <laughs> like we, we both like want what we want and we'll tell you. Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. that's not a bad, that's not a bad combo. I think <laughs> so. <laughs> like internet startups would be great. If like any kind of like getting a business off the ground, get a Scorp- Scorpio and Virgo in charge and that mm-hmm. everything will be great. One hopes, one hopes. <laughs> um, with our, our little publishing business, we hope that that's the truth. Um, so you blogged for a long time before Pathios Pagan and then blogged with Pathios. So I, I feel like blogging is kind of having a heyday again. Mm-hmm. Do you kind of get that sense to you that, you know, people are a little saturated with the quickness of social media and are kind of reverting? I I do think that I think ever since because I I remember in like the late 90s early 2000s when blogging first kind of exploded and within a couple of years people were saying oh blogging is dead and people just thought it was going to be a flash in the pan and a lot of blogs came and went during that period but a lot stuck around and of course Pathio stuck around and with the onset of social media, uh, especially with like Instagram reels and TikTok, where people could get these little bite sized pieces of entertainment or information, people pulled away from blogging for a while. But I think a lot of those little reels and videos and stuff are piquing a lot of curiosity that blogging has the answers to, if that makes sense. Where, no, it does make sense. Yeah. Like, oh, I saw this video on this witchy topic and in Googling it, oh, there's a blogger who writes all about these things. So Mm -hmm. those social media, I think, is pulling us or steering people back towards long form writing. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, I I love the visual aspect of social media. Like I I prefer Instagram, I guess, to TikTok just because I'm old. I don't know. (laughs) Um, but I like the I like it's just like photographs. I like the, you know, these staged photographs that people do. Yeah. I mean, not if they're like out crushing nature to do it. I mean, that's not <laughs> something I'm into, but you know, like just the this I, this kind of cure and to look at it as a curation, not to look at it as somebody's reality, right? Yeah. And I think that's where the danger is. But um overall, I'm not sure social media has been a social good, but <laughs> I would, um, I would definitely agree. Yeah. But I, the thing I love about blogging and I love about the kind of the wilderness, I guess, of the earlier internet is that you really could just have something that was totally uniquely yours. Yes. You know, it's not owned on another platform. You know, meta doesn't own your work. Right. You know, it's, it's your, it's your blog. You can do what you want. And um, what is the, I can never remember the or origin or origination of, you know, a thousand true fans, like you can support yourself on a thousand true fans, basically, Mm -hmm. which you could accumulate on a blog. I mean, it's easy to get a thousand followers on social media, but they're not necessarily going to support your work. But if somebody's coming to your blog every day, exactly, they're going to, they're going to support your work. There is, there is more loyalty there, I think, in blog followers Mm -hmm. and uh, people who uh, are coming to, coming to your site or coming to your blog 
because they appreciate what you have to say and mm -hmm. they want to hear more of it versus other forms of social media where um like TikTok, for example, I, I spend way too much time on TikTok because it's kind of like a fidget spinner for my brain. Mm -hmm. and I really enjoy it. But a lot of people will follow TikTok accounts specifically to argue with them. Yeah. And, you know, and waiting for the next video so that they can pounce and tear it to shreds. Where in the blogosphere, it's more the people who follow you are there because they they are encouraging you to say more. Mm -hmm. And they're interested yeah. in what you have to say versus looking for a way to tear you apart. Yeah. No, that's a good point too. It's like, gosh, who has time for that? <laughs> <laughs> a surprising number of people. <laughs> yeah, I just like, I was too short for that. I don't know. Um, so like as far as writing about magic and, and you, I, I love that um, you're both a gardenerian high priest and a discordian mm -hmm. <laughs> because in my brain, those things don't mesh. Right. So when you're talking about magic, like where does, like, where do you feel like that comes from for you? Like what, what aspects of your work do you feel comfortable sharing? You know, what is, how is that process for you to think about that? In terms of what I write about, I, I tend to focus on things that I either know a lot about, but can explain in an accessible way mm -hmm. or things that I want to learn more about. And then I'm just like, and we're all coming along together on this. And so it's less about like, like, I don't want to ever lecture to people or, or, you know, present in a way where I'm the authority. I would much rather say, let's let we're all in this together. Let's all figure mm -hmm. this out together. Yeah. And that way, like it's, it's informative, but I'm learning stuff along the way as well. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, I, I love that idea about write about what you want to know about. Yeah. Yeah. That was something I learned. There's an author named Deborah Lip who um She's I'm, been on the show. Ah, uh, yay. I love Deborah. <laughs> um, but she one time and we were talking years ago where she had um in her non-witchy life, she also works as a technical writer. And she had gotten this gig where they wanted her to write a blog about search engine optimization. And which was not something she knew about. So her blog was, we're going to figure this out together. And in that field, it turned out to be a very successful blog, but mm -hmm. that's always stuck with me in terms of, you know, love, what, what's something that we would all like to learn more about? Okay, well here, I'm going to find the starting point and we're all just going to mm -hmm. kind of follow the thread and see where it takes us. Yeah. I mean, do you, have you found like, I don't know, I, I've talked to several people and this is definitely true for me. And I'm curious if other people are having this journey that like the the more you've gone into your practice, the more you kind of want to know like the history and the underpinnings. And it's like, I just kind of came into a cult practice, witchcraft, whatever you want to call it. And then was just in the current milieu. And then kind of, as I've gotten older, I've gone back and started reading like foundational documents, I guess. Mm -hmm. Has that been true for you too? Absolutely. That's actually how I ended up Gardnerian, where I um, I started kind of exploring witchcraft when I was in my late teens, like like many of us do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those, those of us who listen to sad music in high school, we, we <laughs> found witchcraft. And I kind of dabbled in it for a number of years. And then at one point, I was just like, I want to know where this comes from. Mm -hmm. Um, in the, especially in the late nineties and early two thousands, when, when everyone was, was, was either identifying as Wicca or referring to their practices as Wicca. And it was, you know, this religion that was 10,000 years old, that was also made up by some British dude. And I was like, there's gotta be some truth here. There's gotta, like, this had to have come from somewhere. <laughs> and I just sort of went down the rabbit hole. And nine months later, I was getting initiated into the Gardnerian tradition. Um, which made me even more interested in the history of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so everything that I, that I practice is stuff that I have gone in and there is a cat on the table right now. <laughs> Pardon me. We have a different podcast today. <laughs> um, but uh, everything that I, that I practice and everything that interests me, I always want to kind of get into the roots of it and, and learn more about the history of it. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that it just informs our practices in general. Yeah. Well, and I just, I, I mean, maybe there is a Scorpio-ness to, I just want to know. Yeah, too, there's that too. You know? I definitely just want to know. 
just want to know. Um, and there's so much like, I don't know, I think about like, I'm doing a lot of research right now on artists. Um, and there's a huge overlap between the occult and artists, right? Oh, absolutely. And just this idea that he's, you know, like uh, Pamela Coleman Smith and a lot of the Dadaists and mm-hmm. like all of these people had these salons that were just like artists and occultists hanging out and talking. Yeah. And I was like, why can't we do that now? <laughs> like, I would, that would be amazing. There was, there's a old book called Bell Book and Murder, which is, I, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, it was written by Rosemary Edgehill and it's, a, yeah. it's several novellas put together. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a scene in the, in early on in the book where the main character goes to the, a salon, just what you're talking about, where this woman, for whatever reason, every week opens up her apartment and puts out a lavish buffet spread and everybody just lounges about and drinks tea and mm-hmm. nobody knows why she does it, but everybody shows up. Yeah. Yeah, that would be I, I love that. I love that. I I really like those books too. Okay, oh, it was the first books I had read that had people who were witches that were just characters. Yes, it wasn't about like CGI magic. It it oh, was right. about like real magic. Like, and a lot of the characters were based on real people and real places in New York, mm-hmm. um, where. Uh, the uh, Serpent's Truth, the occult bookstore that everybody hung out at, was based on the Magical Child bookstore, which mm-hmm. was originally the Warlock Shop. Um, and the character of Bellflower was based on the Wiccan High Priestess, Judy Farrow, mm-hmm. uh, or Judy Harrow. And uh, so the author just really incorporated a lot of things that were really going down at that time in the mid early 90s mm-hmm. um, to make it a, just a very realistic look at neo paganism. Yeah. While also, also being murder mysteries, <laughs> which is fine. Yeah, you get murder mysteries, and you also get that like gritty New York before Times Square was Disneyfied. Yes, yes, which... that was actually a line in the book about the Disneyfication of Times Square continues, mm-hmm. where there was yeah. sort of New York was sort of fighting against it. Yeah, so I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah, no, I do like those books. So, what is your deep dive these days? Like, what are you? What are you interested in? My most recent deep dive, and it's been going on a while, um, and I kind of just, I guess, just kind of pulled my head out from it, is actually lithomancy, where um, I, m- several years ago, somebody introduced lithomancy to me, which is just divination with semi-precious stones. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was sort of introduced to me as like ancient traditional witchcraft. And I was like, mm, mm-hmm. you just when, whenever somebody says that, I'm always like, okay, let's figure out where this actually came from. Um, and I, so I started kind of just digging and following little threads. Um, and it, I found out that the modern practice of lithomancy really originated with Doreen Valiente in, uh, it's, I believe it's witchcraft for tomorrow. Um, a book that came out in 1978, she lays out a system of divination using 13 stones. And she does not say that I made up myself. She just sort of says, (laughs) this is how witches do it. Um, but I, it was really fascinating to kind of start with that and then go through and look at different books and different sources to see how it developed and changed and adapted, but also kind of moving backwards to find out how um, lithomancy was portrayed in ancient history and how it was portrayed in mythology. And uh, so that's that's my current obsession. I have ADHD and I hyperfocus, so I hyperfixated on <laughs> lithomancy and uh yeah. Uh, but I, but it's um, it's something that I've gotten very passionate about, and something that I really enjoy doing, and something that has pr- proved itself to be a very accurate form of divination. Interesting, because I saw you also do geomancy. Yes, and yes. I am currently in the middle of one of Alexander Cummins' geomancy classes courses. Oh, wonderful! Awesome. And I am fascinated by it. And I I bought the course, and then I just waited because I was like, I don't know if I'm smart enough to do this. <laughs> I got into geomancy because tarot had 78 cards and geomancy had 16 forms. And yeah, I was like, I, I can learn 16. I like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, which I guess is true. The lithomancy too. Like you're dealing with a smaller variation right. of things, like even fewer than like casting runes or something. There's very oh, absolutely. few. So when, when you're dealing with anything that has a smaller number of items that you're working with, whether it's the geomantic figures or lithomantic stones or, or even like Lenormand cards where there's only 36, mm-hmm the meanings of those objects tend to be broader Mm -hmm. they have like their core meanings but then they can mean a lot of other things so 
the stories we can tell with readings end up getting a little more tailored mm -hmm. because we see we, there's more room to see how they interact with each other. Yeah. I mean, that's the, what I found. Oh, no, no, I agree. And one of the things I think is interesting and that I really appreciate the way Dr. Al explains it is that, you know, they have their own core and then where they show up in the chart also influences like how they interact with the other figures. And absolutely. There's just, there are a lot of layers. Yes. But now that I'm in it, like I'm fascinated and I don't feel like maybe I'm too stupid. <laughs> Do you know what I'm <laughs> but it just, I, I think initially it just from the outside and a lot of esoteric practice looks like that from the outside. Yeah. You're like, I can never figure this out. But once you dive in, especially with a good book or a good teacher, mm -hmm. you can get there. Oh, absolutely. Um, and oh. geomancy, one thing I love about it is that it can be as simple or complex as you need it to be. Mm hmm where I will oftentimes just just generate a geomantic figure, which which for the listeners who don't know who may not know what geomancy is, it's a binary system of divination where you're generating even or odd numbers through coin tosses or dice or what have you, breaking those numbers down to even and odd, and then using those to create uh, figures and then reading the figures, figures mm -hmm. with like little four levels to them. Yeah. And a lot of times just for yes or no answers or yes or no questions, I'll just generate a quick geomantic figure. Um, which will give me my yes or no, but it will also give me a little more, mm -hmm. a little more information around the situation. Yeah. Oh, I like that. I like that as a way to just kind of approach. Like also that I think when you do those kind of, it's like with tarot or when you do like the one card thing and just kind of figure out that, that card or that yes. geomantic figure or whatever. But yeah. A yes or no answer with some finesse. I always exactly. feel like it's a little bit better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And that's, and this, again, this might be the, the, the Virgo in me, but with divination, I'm often just looking for the yes, no answer. Mm -hmm. You know, do I need, should I make this decision or what will happen if I make this decision? And I just need a positive or negative, favorable or unfavorable. You know, I don't need to know that a, a, a mysterious stranger with reddish brown hair will be approaching me from the East or anything like, or ever. <laughs> However in-depth some forms of divination can be, I just need a, you know, do it, don't do it. You won't regret this. You will regret this. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what works best for me. Yeah. Nice. So now that you have uh, started your lithomancy journey, what, what, like, what would you recommend to folks who wanted to look into that? There, um, Lithomancy is both kind of blessed and cursed with a very small number of resources. Mm -hmm. um, so there aren't that many books out there, which is great uh, because <laughs> you don't have to like, you don't have to worry too much about, you know, is this going to be an accurate book on the subject? They're all, they're all fairly accurate. Um, the one that uh, witchcraft for tomorrow, Doreen's book, I think is, mm -hmm. is probably the best place to start. Mm -hmm. um, there is a book in the, uh, uh, Pagan Portal series called uh, that's just called Lithomancy, um, which is another really good, good just sort of basic introduction. Um, and I'm trying to think that if <laughs> most of them just have Lithomancy in the title. There's yeah. uh, the Lucky Mojo Curio Company put out a book on Lithomancy. Um, there's uh, one by guy whose first name escapes me. His last name is Weber. That's just called Lithomancy. Um, but they all really present a very similar system with just slight differences in how they interpret the individual stones. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And a couple of the more modern books use 16 stones instead of 13 because some of the stones represent the seven classical planets. So if you're into modern astrology, you can add additional stones for the outer uh, planets. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, but with Lithomancy in general, once you kind of get the basic you know, here's what the stones mean. And, he, and, you know, this means yes, this means no. It's a very intuitive form of divination, mm -hmm. which um, was a challenge for me at first, because I just want my very clear answer. I don't want to have to think about what it means. I want <laughs> I, just just tell me what it means. Yeah. Um, but it does have very much I, I think I said this a second ago, uh, very much a storytelling aspect to it. So once you so that comes in when you're sort of looking at the connections between the stones and, you know, the Mars stone and the Mercury stone next to each other might mean one thing in one reading and something entirely different in the next reading. Um, and it's all just, it's very situational, but yeah. that was that, that ends up in having very tailored readings, which comes in very handy. Mm -hmm. 
speaking of storytelling, yes. so one of the things I really enjoyed about Virgo Witch um, is I have read Taurus Witch, mm-hmm. the one with Thorn Mooney and yes. now yours. And, and um, I do like, I feel like one of the things about the series um, that I find really interesting, and I think it is, is especially true of your book of the, of the two I've read, is that it's really a story about mm-hmm. what it is to do this. And I love the stories that you share in the book. Um, I don't want to spoil them for anybody because I think people, <laughs> you know, if they want to read it, they should go pick it up. But um, but how did you decide like what, I mean, cause you're basically using your life to illustrate what it means to be a Virgo mm-hmm. witch. So how did you decide what stories to tell? Uh, you know, they, um, Llewellyn and Evo Dominguez, when they, as they were putting the series together, they came up with sort of um, standardized chapters of mm-hmm. what, what they felt would um, be the best stories for the co-authors to tell. Um, so like for me, it was, and I think it was the same throughout the series, but then we all just tailored it individually to our, mm-hmm. to our own books. Um, but they wanted me to write about uh, my most Virgo witch moment and um what's uh what's like the biggest obstacle for a virgo witch and so i was able to uh, come up with stories that matter instead of just having like a complete blank slate and being like <laughs> I, don't, I don't know i'm I'm just sort of <laughs> i'm a control freak and that's it um they gave us uh, kind of a template that we could work with yeah um and that way i was able to and that was one of those things that really reinforced my own virgoness was it was not when they said what's your most virgo moment I was like, oh, that time I took over a ritual in the woods because I didn't mm-hmm. like how they were doing it. And mm-hmm. what's the biggest obstacle? Oh, Mercury retrograde. So it was it it was uh, very easy to come up with the stories to mm-hmm. to match what they were the stories that they were wanting to tell. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, it, it's for folks who have not seen these books yet. Um, Evo writes like the hard. Astrology parts, mm-hmm. I guess, is a way to put it. And then the co-author has kind of stories and how they work with, like you have a, a section about lithomancy in there and right. it's like different ways, like how Virgos might do magic. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of other contributors. There's like a recipe and there's some correspondences and some spells and some stuff that are contributed mm-hmm. by other folks. So they're really like a, almost like a mini anthology. Each book is almost like a mini anthology. Absolutely. And that that was really the goal of the project where mm-hmm. none of us are going to ever know as much about astrology as Evo does. <laughs> so he, they, so um, he was absolutely the right person to write the whole, to write, be mm-hmm. the anchor author, to, right. to write half of each book. But they um, they wanted to bring in a witch of each sign to really show sort of what it's like living day to day as a witch mm-hmm. of this sign mm-hmm. and to um, bring in the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not the entertainment value that like they weren't like, okay, dance, Virgo Witch, dance. It wasn't, you know, <laughs> it wasn't the fluffy stuff, but it was the um just the more of the the daily applications of these things, both the good and the bad, which often results in some misadventures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we all have those. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like that's highlighted in all of the books. Yeah. Magical mishaps are often the most entertaining stories. Those are my favorite. I, I I enjoy the magical missteps quite a bit. Um, so I have to ask now that you've co-written this book with Evo, do you have the bug to write another book? Um, my de- deadline for my second draft of the next book is at the end of this month. So yes. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I, I ended up with two projects from Llewellyn at the same side, same time. So I had, um, already been in talks with an editor Llewellyn about a book and then um like right around the same time that the Virgo Witch project launched and so I had to set the first book aside to do Virgo Witch and now I'm scrambling to get caught up on the second book Mm -hmm. but that will probably be out in late 2024 or possibly early 2025 okay well you'll have to come back on and talk about it I would be delighted to um so when you when you told that story earlier about, oh my God, I've been blacklisted, you mm-hmm. really had a reason to be worried. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Book absolutely. In the <laughs> absolutely. Because I had already been, um, I had already started kind of pitching an idea for a book. Um, 
I it had not been officially accepted or anything. So I just was like, you know, we'll see what happens. So then when a Llewellyn editor wanted to talk to me, I was like, oh, you can just send that proposal back. I'll 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 give it to Wiser. It's fine. It's fine. And yeah. uh, <laughs> it turned out that uh, it worked. It worked out okay. So I guess this is. I don't know that I've asked anyone this exactly. So you get a first question. Awesome. Um, so what was like, what was your pitch process? Because I've talked to a lot of folks who were just like, oh, I did, you know, Mystic South that I did a mm -hmm. speed dating pitch or whatever. Right. Or, I, you know, somebody asked me to write the book or so when you got ready to pitch the idea, how did you decide who you wanted to pitch to what you were going to, you know, what were, uh what was your process around them? I had been introduced to an editor at Llewellyn uh, through a, a friend of mine who had also written a book through Llewellyn. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I had nothing like I had a, the vaguest of concepts for a book. Um, but this friend of mine was like, hey, I want you to meet my editor. And so I introduced myself and just this was all kind of via email and said, I have an idea for this book. And uh, they said, OK, great. Um, here is like the the not submission form but basically here's here is the uh questionnaire to fill out about the book that you want to write and just whenever you're whenever you feel like sending it in just just fill it out and send it in and so i sat on it for a number of months because you know i had i basically had a title but i had no idea what the book would be about um and i finally just just kind of sucked it up and filled out you know the questionnaire and it was things like um you know uh list off some other books and that are similar to what you want to write but explain how your book is different like what questions does your book answer that these books will not mm -hmm. um and there is a silver bullet aspect like you are or what's called the silver bullet so it's like basically give us an elevator pitch like you've just gotten on an elevator with an editor and you have 30 seconds to sell your book to them so i'd write a little paragraph about that mm -hmm. um and I just sent that back to the editor and uh, a couple of weeks later they accepted it and sent me a contract. Nice. Um, so That's it was a quick not, turnaround too. It, it was, it was. And sometimes it is a very quick turnaround. It was, it was not a very difficult process, um, mm -hmm. but it was, it still required a lot of effort yeah. in terms of, I'm not, uh, I'm not naturally skilled at selling myself. Um, okay. And so, you know, to to write out this proposal in which that's all all I'm doing is, you know, here's not only not only here's a book you should publish, but here's why I should be the one to write it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a scary thing um, because, they, you know, a, a less reputable publisher could be like, great idea. We're going to give this title to somebody else and, you know, we're going to send you a Arby's gift certificate or something you know <laughs> just yeah. like thanks um, but no yeah but they they were like okay this is the book you want to write we feel that you can write this so we're going to give mm -hmm. you the chance to do so do you feel like doing the their process like the questionnaire do you feel like that kind of helped tailor your book idea to them rather than kind of this i don't i don't want to say generic because it's not really the right word but i guess it, more yeah it did help me um narrow it down into something that they would be looking for mm -hmm. um and especially the, the question that helped me the most was uh the part about comparing what i want to write to books that are already published mm -hmm. um because the my ideas for the book really kind of coalesced as i was working on this proposal um because it was like you know what is the book going to be about and i was like oh well here's what here's what i would like to write about and oh here's how i can organize it um but uh, the book itself, uh, which it, it is okay to talk about this part, um, it's basically going to be about uh, the intersection of chaos magic and witchcraft mm -hmm. and and the practical aspects of both. Um, so I was able to say, well, here's like one of the classic books on chaos magic that doesn't really address witchcraft and it doesn't come at things from witchcraft point of view. So that's what my book would do. Mm -hmm. um, here's a book on witchcraft that touches on chaos magic, but doesn't really get in depth into how to apply it. So mm -hmm. my book will have the application of cast magic to witchcraft and that helped me really uh think in terms of how i would write a book that would be informative in the way i wanted it to be 
Mm -hmm. that it wouldn't just be me just kind of bubbling my thoughts around. It would be like, no, here's an actual practical guide. Yeah. So in that respect, it really helped. Yeah. And I do feel like, I mean, I don't, I don't know that you can exactly pigeonhole like all of the occult publishers, but mm -hmm. Llewellyn's books do tend to be very practical hands yes. on exercises, spells. There's, there's something to do. Exactly. And um, that, uh, yeah, that is very much, um, like even way back in the, like the mid nineties, when I first started reading Llewellyn mm -hmm. books, it was always the practical guide to, mm -hmm. and, um, that's always been a big theme is putting up books that people can actually use. Yeah. Like they're not, they're not just the, it's not just going to be a book that sits on the shelf that you occasionally look up a correspondence in. Like this is yeah. a book that gives you ideas and things to work on. Although they're a big giant book of correspondence, Sandra Kynes, big giant book of correspondences. I do use a lot. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that whole series of like what the complete, it was the one that just came out, the North American Folk Magic one. Like yes. Those complete books are, are really interesting to you. Absolutely. Yeah, I am. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's fascinating like, to think about where a book belongs. Mm -hmm. Like when you have an idea, like where does this book belong? And um, like in the occult world, there's, you know, can count the publishers on two hands, basically, right. that most people are going to think about. And um, obviously there's big ones and there's more boutique ones. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you have people like Simon Schuster get in on the game, too. So, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So it's it's interesting to think about where a book lives or where it what? can live. One thing I thought about in terms of where it could live was, and what I, and in terms of what I wanted to write about was I had a background in chaos magic and I had a background in discordianism, which was a big influence on, on early chaos magicians. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that over time, especially on certain aspects of social media, more and more people were calling themselves chaos witches, which and at first I was very excited about that because the first person I ever heard refer to themselves as a chaos witch was an author named Kellyanne Maddox, mm -hmm. um, who has an extensive background in chaos magic and does an amazing YouTube series about chaos magic. And she explained why she used witch instead of magician and it all made perfect sense. And so I would get onto Instagram or TikTok and see people saying, I'm a chaos witch. And I would be like, great. And they'd be like, look how lazy and disheveled my practice is. And I was like, that's not chaos magic. That's um, just chaos. That's just, yeah, that's, and that's chaotic and it's different. And I realized that this was something that was growing in popularity, but it was also something that nobody really knew what it was. Mm -hmm. And um, I, wa I was like, this is something where I could actually contribute and give people some direction so that if somebody wanted to be a chaos witch and really wanted to identify as that, that there was actually meaning behind that. And they had a resource that they could draw on. Yeah, I, I I have encountered those same kind of like, I don't think this word means what you think it means. Yes. In this context. Yes. Stuff. And I, I'm always surprised that people are like, oh, chaos magic is this new thing. And I'm like, Austin Oz and Spare was born in the 1800s. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is not particularly new. I mean, it's no, new and, in the grand scheme of the universe, but like, it's not like yesterday name. and william burroughs was a chaos magician mm -hmm. not not the world's best known one but he was yeah. doing some really interesting stuff with uh um with what are called cut-ups of mm -hmm. he um would like record a scene like just use audio like use a tape recorder and record the background noise of something and then splice in other sounds to kind of rewrite reality in a way that he wanted mm -hmm. um and uh yeah and definitely austin osmond fair is like, the, like one of the original pioneers um and it's something that cast magic got uh really popular in england in the 80s and 90s but didn't really jump across the pond like mm -hmm. americans weren't that aware of it um until recently and so there's been this kind of surge of interest in it but nobody realizes what the roots of it are yeah i shouldn't say nobody realizes a lot of people realize yeah, a lot but, of people don't realize yeah um, but people are very aware of the idea of chaotic specifically because of the influence of role playing games. Mm -hmm. And so that word has become very popular. So people are applying that to their witchcraft practice, not realizing that chaos magic actually does have some form and framework and function to it. Right. 
And I think too, I mean, unfortunately, I think like some other aspects of occultism, you know, there has been some like sticky, unpleasant political stuff attached to chaos magic, just like with yeah. the heathenism. And I mean, there's, it's just there and we know it's there and you, you have to kind of sort the, I, it's a, it would be an insult to chaff to call them chaff. I don't know what, <laughs> you know, the word is not coming to my mind or what I want to use, but yeah, I'm um, actually bullshit. The, the bullshit from like the actual stuff that's good, you know, this, you know, I'm so glad I, I don't need your political I, garbage. I swear like a sailor and, and I've been trying so hard not to curse. So thank you for well, We have an explicit me. rating because my thought when I started the podcast was not necessarily, I mean, I, I do swear, but was that someone would get their panties in a wad that we were talking about witchcraft or sex magic or something and gotcha. record it. So I was like, well, just make it explicit and I don't have to worry about it. So <laughs> I think where we get some of those, uh, the people that you're describing within chaos magic is sort of a fundamental misunderstanding of what chaos magic is, mm -hmm. where it, it's kind of whatever you want it to be, but to a point, but with some, with a framework around it with right. within some parameters and um people describe chaos magic the way people used to describe eclectic witchcraft and paganism where like back in the early 2000s somebody would say oh i'm an eclectic witch i take from everything and the problem with taking something is it means that the person you're taking it from doesn't have it anymore right. like you've you know and chaos magic does draw a lot of inspiration from outside sources and there's an idea of trying things out and experimenting with them and seeing if they work and mm -hmm. if they don't work how can you make them work and can you make them work consistently and which people sometimes interpret as oh so you just take from things and I'm like no not quite it's yeah. you know there's there's the a friend of mine describes it really well as you know when you go to a museum, you look at all the art and it might inspire you and you may take that inspiration and go home and create your own art that was influenced by the art you saw at the museum, but it's not taking the art mm -hmm. versus somebody going in and like stealing a painting and selling it on the black market. Yeah. You well, know? and I think like there are, there are aspects of like, um, Austin Spares practice and mm -hmm. like the Burroughs cut up practice and stuff like that, that, have reached mainstream witchcraft without their attendant understanding, yes. like sigil work and, and those kind of things. Oh, and it's nice to see that people are now going back and going, Oh, that's where this comes from. That's who came up with these ideas. So. I, I will try not to go on a full blown rant about sigils. I will give you a soapbox if you would like to go in a full blown a rant. soapbox, <laughs> my favorite. Don't mind if I do. Um, so one thing that, I, I I try really hard, especially on social media media, to stay very laid back and reasonable. And I um like on TikTok, I have this reputation as the nice one, which is great because I do try to be very mm -hmm. encouraging and understanding. And I, you know, and not get involved in the witch wars and and the the slapping fights. But I get so angry when I see videos on sigils because somebody will say, so today we're going to learn how to make sigils. This is the only way to make sigils. This is the correct way to make sigils. So we're going to write out our intent and we're going to cross out the letters and we're going to make a little design and that's how you make sigils. And I'm like, no, that is a way to make sigils. That is not the one way to make sigils. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a method that was based on Spare's work and that was popularized within Chaos Magic. But even the Chaos Magic books that talked about that method of making sigils offered it as one of several ways of making sigils mm -hmm. yeah and like the way i've make sigils that works for me is very automatic writing where i mm -hmm. just kind of close my eyes and think about what i'm trying to make happen and just make a random doodle that doesn't look like anything but it encapsulates the sigil work i'm trying to accomplish right um and uh laura tempest Zakroff has a couple of amazing books about sigil work about using her very specific unique method of sigil that incorporates a lot of artistic techniques and the one complaint that she gets about her books is well there that that's just symbols that's not letters and numbers you have to use letters and numbers to which tempest always says what do you think letters and numbers are they are symbols mm -hmm. you know so it's yeah. 
sigil work is something that came out of this very freeform practice or freeform tradition that has gotten very crystallized in cement Mm -hmm. when it's it's something that we should you know if you doodle something and you are able to bring about a change in reality because of that doodle it doesn't matter how you made the doodle Uh that matters that it works for you yeah because there's also like the the letter wheel thing Mm -hmm. i mean there's like and using number square i mean there's so many ways people do this oh absolutely um, there is um, uh, stick figures can work as sigils of oh. drawing. Um, this is something I picked up from. I want to say it was mentioned in one of Peter Carroll's books where he was sort of one of the pioneers of modern chaos magic of just drawing, drawing a scene basically out of just doesn't have to be, you know, doesn't have to have artistic merit, mm-hmm. but just drawing the scene and then combining those elements to make the sigil instead of actually writing out what you want, drawing out what you want. Like little stick figure comic panel kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, oh, and then nice. rearranging those elements to create the sigil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I like that. It, it's something that there's just a wide variety of approaches to, and so when and it did specifically come out of chaos magic, and so it makes me crazy when people are like, "Here is ancient traditional witchcraft, the sigil." And I'm like, "Oh, read a book." I mean, was- symbols, yes. Yeah, but you're confusing the the topic yeah exactly and there are several um trends in witchcraft just because just like anything else witchcraft has its trends Mm -hmm. and some of those trends are coming out of chaos magic but there's this disconnect between the original source of the trend and the trend now Mm -hmm. um like there was a there was a fad for a while about pop culture deities and everybody was gonna we're all gonna work with pop culture deities but that was that came out of uh phil hein's work you know, and people may not know who Phil Hine is, but they know that this girl on TikTok was talking about it. So it's true. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, don't mean to I bash mean, TikTok. I love TikTok. I should no, 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 stop I think you're speaking right. on TikTok. It's like, well, I think, you know, those ideas get out there through social media, but there isn't the underpinning of, you know, even if that person is talking about it and they know where it's from, if they don't say that. Mm hmm. Then the next person who plays telephone with that idea doesn't realize that it didn't originate with that person. Exactly. They, you know, that they're talking about something that they've studied or whatever. So, yeah, no, I think it is just a. It's like a weird mix of social media and oral tradition telephone. I don't. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. There was and this is actually what this is something I, I, I learned from being Gardnerian that I've always sort of taken with me is. The. Uh, there's different lines within the Gardnerian tradition that trace back through different priestesses. So I'm part of the Long Island line and the Long Island line has always been known for having this, what is often called the forklift book of shadows. It's just, just massive BOS. Um, and what was happening was that people would, you know, you'd, you'd have your book of shadows and you might write a spell or you might, find a piece of poetry that was really meaningful for you, or you might, you know, hear a song and the lyrics meant something, or you might find a bit of folklore that was interesting and people would add that to their BOS and then they would pass that on to their initiates. And then those initiates would, you know, find some other information or write some more spells and rituals and add that. And so we ended up with this gargantuan book of shadows that people were like, Oh, and this all came directly from Gardner. This has all been passed down. And somebody was like, wait, no, it hasn't. So as a tradition, we had to go back and document everything so that we knew what was the, what was core, what was additions, where those additions came from. Um, and uh, so now that is what's passed. <laughs> like, here's annotated. everything. And yeah, and here's where it all came from. Yeah. Um, just so that we have a better understanding of our own history. Uh, and so that's something that just even when I'm doing my crazy chaos magic and discordian stuff, I'm always making sure to document where I find things Mm -hmm. and, and write down not only what the idea is, but where it came from. Yeah. So that if I need, when I'm explaining it to other people, I can say for more information, you know, go here, but also so that like, as I'm writing a book on the subject and my editor says, you know, where did this idea come from? I don't have to go, I don't know. I guess I came up with it. Yeah. You know, And I think that's, I don't, I feel like, it's one of those things, and I've talked about this with other folks on the show. It's like, I I so appreciate that we're kind of in this period of where like occult books are footnoted and yes. documented. 
And then I also, part of me is like, but there is also personal gnosis that has value. And absolutely. And I, you know, it's like how I just, I, I have heard people kind of be negative about both aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to be positive about, about both aspects of it. Like I, I love that people are sharing their personal experience. Like I think that enriches even heavily footnoted books, right? Like just Mm -hmm. have their own, like your story is in the Virgo witch book. Those are not something that you're going to say, Oh, well this came from blah, 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 blah. It's like, this was my personal experience. Exactly. No, I think, I think the happy medium definitely includes both. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, it's great to have the documentation and the footnotes and the references um, because, you know, all of us are, are, are springboarding off of other people's ideas. Like we, we got, we had to get our start somewhere and that's going to, mm-hmm. that start was with things that other people come up with. Um, but in order to kind of move forward with our own, with, within our own practices, we have to be experiencing things and, and documenting those experiences goes on to help the next generation of witches uh, to have their own experiences. Mm-hmm. So that is something that I try to be very clear about is when I am like putting somebody else's concept on display or when I am putting my own original idea on display um, just so that the two don't get confused. Yeah. Or so that when, like when I write about lithomancy or talk about lithomancy, people understand that this is my very modern take on it. Versus, no, this was not how the ancient Saxon witches did it. Mm-hmm. This is how I do it. Yeah. Well, and I think what, are, like, just personally, like, I've been doing research for a book and um, there's a lot of herbal lore in it. And so mm-hmm. I've been, like, dipping into Scott Cunningham's encyclopedia, right? Uh-huh. And he has a great bibliography in the back, but they're not referenced in the citation. You know, there's no citations right. in the book. They're just the bibliography. And then I'm kind of like trying to sift through that to find out, well, where did this come from exactly? exactly? And sometimes I have not been able to root out like where this came from. And I'm like, is this, you know, Cunningham's personal gnosis, but there's no way to know that now. Absolutely. So. And I think, I think there was quite a bit of personal gnosis in his, in his herbal book specifically, because mm-hmm. he, he was an herbalist and he did a mm-hmm. lot of cool, yeah. you know, unique things with herbs um, that was sort of, the way occult books were written at the time mm-hmm. was, you know, there was a period where there was no bibliography, right? Where it was everything was just this is witchcraft, and I didn't make it up, I swear. Yeah. And then there was books with the bibliography, but there was not the footnotes, mm-hmm. and so there was no way of really, you know, connecting what was um, the book that I talk about a lot when when th- this comes up is um, Aidan McCoy's Witta, an Irish mm-hmm. pagan tradition she has a bibliography or she had a big bibliography in that book and she had a lot of resources in that book, but big chunks of the book were her own sometimes very fanciful takes on Irish pagan history. And it would be easy, very easy to go, Oh, but there's a bibliography. So clearly this is, this is all recorded. This is all documented history and very little of it was, Yeah, there was workable stuff in there and there were some neat ideas in there, but there was a disconnect between what she was claiming to reference and what she actually wrote. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and then, and then you just kind of are left to sort that out. Especially yeah. if you're coming, I like, I always think about if this is the first book you pick up. Yeah. Like what, what is that going to, what door is this opening? I guess what door is yeah. this opening? So. I, you know, my first two books when I was, I think maybe 19 years old and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I bought Celtic witchcraft or Celtic magic by DJ Conway and Scottish witchcraft by Raymond Buckland. Mm -hmm. And I read those books and I thought, I don't believe a word of any of this, but I'm going to move forward as if it is true. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but that I had to kind of wrestle with skepticism for a very long time because like, it would be lovely if everything in Celtic magic was, (laughs) was you know was was documentable and it would mm-hmm. be lovely i don't know if you've ever read scottish witchcraft but it was i feel like i have i skimmed it a long time ago but i don't i don't have like a good reference for it it was so buckland claimed to have met this old scottish man who practiced a solitary form of wicca because at the time wicca and witchcraft were very interchangeable terms right 
And so this guy was practicing this solitary form of Wicca um, that traced back to the Picts in Scotland. Um, and he initiated Buckland and then died. So, <laughs> like he gave Buckland all his wisdom and then then rode off into the Summerlands. It's very Black Pullet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, that's an old trope in, yeah. in, in occultism that goes back centuries of, mm. you know, I'm... Yeah, I guess the black pole was that was the uh, the soldier going into the pyramid and, yes, and meets the guy the, the saving ma- him and dragging him into the pyramid and giving him all his magic and then dying. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, you know, that was even back in the, like the 16th century and the 15th century with the grimoire traditions of, mm-hmm. oh, this is, you know, ris- all this wisdom written by an ancient Egyptian who didn't exist. Actually, Frank wrote it all. He's sitting over there, but we don't call him Frank. We call him the ancient Egyptian who never existed. <laughs> We just say everything we wrote was Hermes Trismegistus, so we just go from there. Yes. That, Pretend like uh, we didn't write it. That is, he is he is going to be my go-to. I'm just, you know what, for my book, I'm going to be like, according to Hermes Trismegistus, <laughs> I will, I'm going to throw that in <laughs> at least seven or eight times. Like it. Like it. But that was especially like in the moving up until the eight, I, would, I want to say the early 1800s when people really started getting more into like a Europe romantic view of European pagan history, mm-hmm. everything was like attributed to the ancient Egyptians. And like tarot cards came from Egypt and mm-hmm. all forms of magic came from Egypt and everything just went probably because the British Museum was stealing all of it at that time. So it was just on everybody's mind. It seemed magical. They were eating mummies at parties. I mean, oh, you I know. know. Like, ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it just, if anything had any mystical undercurrent, it clearly came from Egypt. Yeah, I, I think about like Victorians and I'm like, what what made you think that this was a good idea? <laughs> like, I don't know. To be as like weirdly superstitious as they often were, it's like you're gonna eat an ancient mummy. Like, did you think about that this is cannibalism and just a really old corpse? I I, I, I don't just so many weird things. I can't what was the purpose of eating the mummies? I re- I remember there was like, it's like a, medicinal. They yeah. also made paint. Out of it, out of mummies. I just don't feel like eating dead people is medicinal. That's just me. That's that's a me problem. But I mean, it is a me problem too. Like I don't know about that. But um, but several people pointed out, you know, like the reason there are so few extant mummies, even though there were thousands and thousands of them, is because they unwrapped them at parties, they made paint out of them, or they burned them for fuel. Yeah, which is just insane to me. Yeah. yeah, you know, people sometimes talk about, oh, I was born in the wrong decade or I was born in the wrong century and I would do so well. If, like if I woke up tomorrow in Victorian England, I would just be like, what is wrong with you people? Like, I don't even feel like if I'd been born in Victorian times, I would <laughs> I would be yeah. able to accept what was going on. I would not be going to mummy parties. I would I would not be one of the elite. It would. No. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I feel like um, most like I, I think any like a modern person i know who went back into victoria times they would probably be like okay it's time to burn you as a witch i know we're past that but we're gonna do it anyway (laughs) but we're doing it just in case yeah so yeah there's just there's such a huge disconnect especially and i I mean i think i know as a fiction writer like i always think about this when you're writing like historical characters and it's it's very easy to go okay well my character is like the outlier and there were outliers in all periods there were always outliers but -hmm. those were outliers they weren't the majority of people exactly and and i can i can see that how it'd be easy to want us to show to show a main character as sort of more evolved or aware than they actually would be during that time Mm -hmm. period yeah and a lot of i mean you know like i said there there were definitely people i mean you look at blake like he had some ideas that no one else was having at that time, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like there are always people who are like kind of in or Tesla or, you know, you know, just. Oh yeah. There Blavatsky, were always people who were ahead of their times. Or weirdness, you know, like they're just, <laughs> yeah. There's just always people who are kind of doing their own thing. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, and I, I kind of wish more of those people were remembered fondly. I don't think mm-hmm. people, because and there is, there is still a very, I'm glad you used the word disconnect because I think that's what it is between um, modern occultism and contemporary paganism and our history. And so people who were doing very progressive things 
you know, in the early days of the modern pagan revival are now looked back on with a certain amount of scorn and mm -hmm. uh, for not being progressive. Right. But it was like, okay, yeah, they weren't as progressive as we are today, but it was still 1940s in England. Like we have to give them a little bit of wiggle room. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there is like, you're, you're right. There is that like balance of like people are a product of their time, mm -hmm. but they can have their own thoughts. Yeah. And they can, you know, like you said, be progressive for their time. And then it's not fair to judge them a hundred percent against current mores yeah. and beliefs and where we exactly. are. Exactly. Although I will say, you know, people often say that about like Christopher Columbus. And I'm like, no, people at the time thought he was too much. Oh, yeah. Didn't like, they, you need I to go they, look at the history. They thought he was too much then. Didn't they send him in search of spices just to sort of like get him out of court? Well, that and when he came back and he had basically raped and pillaged his way across the Caribbean, they're like, dude, you need to calm down. This is disgusting. <laughs> what you're doing yeah. is wrong. And, you know, like even then when you had colonialists saying, you're too much. When the Spanish yeah. are telling you you're too much, you're <laughs> you too need to much. Tone it down. You need yeah. to calm down a little bit. So yeah, I was like, uh, no, he was a problem then. He's yeah. still a problem. He was a problem then. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but I, and there are I, there are certainly problematic figures who are not remembered for being problematic when they should mm -hmm. be. Yeah. And there are others who are like this is um it was something i just sort of like realized one day i had like a revelation about it where people online were complaining about gerald gardner and they were saying all these things about gerald gardner and at some point i was like you mean alex sanders and they were oh. like and they were like who's that and i was like okay that's the problem but they are different people <laughs> yeah but people are people tend to remember a lot of the things that alex sanders did and a lot of the stuff that he taught to like the Ferrars who wrote books about it. Mm -hmm. And they remember all that stuff, but they don't remember Sanders. So they sort of, there's this like blank space between Gardner and Sanders that people are like, oh, well, Gerald Gardner did all these things. And it's like, no, Alex Sanders did. No, that was Sanders. Yeah. <laughs> this was also that happened after Gardner died. So it's while well, realizing that I can, that, um, that it is not within my ability to like, inform everybody of accurate history mm -hmm. um i do try to that's a lot about with what i write whether on my blog or when i'm on tiktok or even in mm -hmm. some of the books is sort of saying you know let's look at the actual history of things we don't yeah. have to like everybody we don't have to say these were all great people but let's attribute the problems to the people who are actually problematic right and and not give those people a pass uh well and i you know it's like when people I, I personally, I've had this experience. Like, I, I find Crawley incredibly problematic oh, yeah. for many reasons, but it is impossible to separate most modern practice that most people do. There's some Crawley in there, and you can't get away from it. Yeah. So it's better to know kind of what he was about and understand where he stole and plundered and then think about that rather yeah. than just dismiss everything whole cloth because otherwise you i don't know what you're going to left what you're going to be holding when you're done yeah so yeah let's make reparations let's repair things <laughs> let's think about where they're from and, kind of and like, not be so steely in the future <laughs> it's kind of like how we're you know we're stuck in a capitalistic society and there's no way to live within a capitalistic society that doesn't harm someone mm -hmm. Like we can, we can, um, focus on harm reduction and we can cause as little harm as possible, but the nature of the society of our culture is that mm -hmm. somebody's going to get taken advantage of at some point yeah. and we can just do our best to avoid that, but we can't avoid it completely. And it's the same thing with the occult. There are, you know, the, this never fails to crack me up, but some of like the loudest anti Wicca voices out there are practicing Wicca. They don't realize yeah. it. Yeah, you know they they call it other things, but they don't realize how influenced paganism was by the onset of Wicca and how much of Wicca was sort of forcibly assimilated into other aspects of paganism. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's uh, it just always cracks me up when somebody will be like, "Wicca is cultural appropriation." Today we're celebrating Maybon, and I'm like, "Okay, where did that term come from, hon?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's it's. It's good to be aware of things, realizing that we can't always separate things out, but 
you know, whenever I feel like whenever we write off one area of the occult and say, this is, you know, and it's not, not to speak, speak, speak ill of my fellow white people, but it's always going to be white people going, those white people are problematic. These are the ones who did all the bad stuff. I'm incapable of doing those things. Please join me for my Wicca practice mm-hmm. that I'm not calling Wicca. Yeah. And I'm like, mm, maybe some self-examination. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and, and it's not in, I mean, that's the thing, you know, I think it's easy to go, okay, well, I will get to this enlightened place. No, yeah. <laughs> like this is lifelong work to undo this stuff and figure out where things came from. And it Absolutely. isn't just the work of the occult. I mean, like, look at Christianity, look at any other religion and the stuff they've done. And, you know, it's, I think, you know, we're pretty hard on ourselves once we kind of look at it, but it's not just a occult problem. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Well, and it's any, pretty much any religion or spirituality in the world at some point, somebody went, you know, I'll bet I can make some money off this, mm-hmm. you know, and I know that we love to romanticize the past, but there were just as many swindlers and con artists back then as there were today. And there were, you know, there were fortune tellers in ancient Greece given tragic fortunes and saying, oh, but if you give me some extra money, I can take this curse off you. Right. You know, um, th- that's not something that just happens on social media spam. Yeah. There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> there is not. There is not. Oh. Well, I want to make sure we stick kind of to an hour, although I think we'll go over a little bit. That's, okay. <laughs> That's um, fine with me. But before we do our little game of chance question at the end, oh, I want to give you an opportunity to plug what's coming up for you. Uh, okay. We talked a little bit about some upcoming stuff, but where can people find you and what's coming up for you? Uh, if you want to find me and find upcoming stuff, um, you can go to thumperforge.com. Um, it, it is a very bare bones website, but it, it'll have information on um me and my upcoming projects projects and um uh appearances where i'll be um my next big thing is i'm get i i'm one of the guests of honor at austin witch fest which is a surprisingly huge event in april mm-hmm. i what i attended last year thinking it would be like oh, i'll be like 150 100 200 people no 2000 people showed up um wow. yeah it's a one day event and it's absolutely amazing um so i'll be there um I, uh, you can always find me at Patheos Pagan, Fivefold Law. Um, if you just Google Fivefold Law as one word, I will pop up. <laughs> it's, I have, I've used that as all my social media handles. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just start with the website and, uh, then keep it out for Virgo Witch. And in about a year, there will be a book on Chaos Witchcraft. Awesome. All right. So for our last question, I'm going to roll the die. Excellent. And, um, as a Scorpio Witch. I always joke that I don't know how to do small talk as a Scorpio <laughs> person. So uh, depending on what number I roll, you'll get a question about death, sex, religion, politics, or magic. Okay. And I roll six, you get to pick what you want. And because I don't really want a lot of rules around this game, if I roll something, you're like, nah, I don't want to answer that. We'll roll it again. So. This is very Discordian. I am 100% in. Awesome. Cool. Two. Sex. Sex. Okay. Give me a sex question. Excellent. Okay. So one of the things that Virgos are stereotypical about is either being really squeaky and uptight about sex Mm -hmm. or freaky. True Mm -hmm. or false? True. (laughs) We Virgos like to, and this was, I went back and forth about whether or not to put this in the book Mm -hmm. um, because Virgos like to present ourselves as as very put together and very proper we're very proper um but we have dark sides and we can be very kinky and we can be um very freaky uh we don't want anyone to know um you know we're virgos uh virgos don't have only fan pages Virgos are the ones you see on the hookup apps that are just like neck down. <laughs> um, personally, I have embraced this by working at a leather and fetish workshop. Um, but uh, yeah, Virg- Virgos are uh, we I, I'm struggling with terminology for it because I am a Virgo and I want to be proper. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, we are we are a freaky people. Um <laughs> 
we just will refuse to identify as such in public. Like if you have like had a crazy hookup with a Virgo and you run into that Virgo as a coffee shop, they will they will absolutely pretend they don't know who you are. But as soon as you leave, they will text you and be like, what's up? <laughs> I do want my barista to know, but <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a dark alley over here if you want to get caught up. Yeah, yeah that's funny. Um, yeah, I, it's just one of those things. It's like, you know, all of the signs, like what there's even, I mean, there's like a start, like sex signs, you know, there's yeah. all that kind of stuff out there. But I feel like Virgos and Scorpios get a lot dumped on them, like in this realm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I just I just feel like uh, and it's probably projection of the other signs, because I think I think Scorpios are seen as very sexually liberated. And I think Virgos are um, very much seen as keeping secrets at times like, mm-hmm. oh, you can't be that proper. You can't be that. What's going on? What's going on? And so other signs get jealous of us <laughs> and and of all and they're of all the naughty, naughty things that we're doing behind closed doors. Yeah. Yeah. Which we will not tell them about because we are Virgos and Scorpios. Right. Well, and I feel like, you know, like in general, Virgos and Scorpios, maybe it's just because I have so many Virgos in my life and I am a Scorpio and I have a lot of Scorpio friends. I feel like we, like when you read horoscopes, it's always like, oh, fluffy, fluffy, Virgo. Oh, you uptight, whatever. And you get uh-huh. to Scorpio, it's like, you're going to murder all your friends. And I'm like, <laughs> what is the deal here? Like, why do people hate on us so much? <laughs> it is it is projection. It is people um, not wanting to look at the unsavory aspects of their own signs and their own mm-hmm. charts and projecting it onto other people. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. Scorpio makes a good target for that. I guess so. Well, I feel like Virgo gets a lot of, it gets a lot of crap to you. So. Yeah. And then there's like, you know, the Libras between us that are just like. <laughs> yeah. Libra doesn't get enough crap. I've dated Libras. I have my, my mom was a Libra and I have a stellium in Libra. So, yeah, uh, Libras, Libras probably do need to get not. I mean, not my mom needs more crap, but my stellium in Libra probably needs to get more crap. My weakness has always been Aquarius. Where I've just learned where somebody's like, wow, that guy's amazing. And I'm like, yeah, he is. Oh, he's he's just smart and funny and handsome. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you should date. And I'm like, absolutely not. No. Born in January, not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I learned the hard way that uh, I cannot date other water signs. Really? Yes. I jokingly referred to you before I met my, my current partner that... Um, uh, Pisces were the potholes in my life and Scorpios <laughs> were the cage matches. I can see that. So, and the cancers and I never really, I never, I think I met like one cancer person. Yeah. I think I would do really well with a Taurus. I think if I was in a relationship with another Virgo, we would strangle each other. <laughs> it's like, who, who is the most in charge in this situation? <laughs> exactly. It would be very like, like we would just trigger each other's pet peeves. To the point where somebody get mm-hmm. would get stabbed. It just yeah. Well, I think one of the things about Virgos, and I think this is true of Scorpios to a certain extent, is it very easy for us to become uh, disappointed perfectionists. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, if it can't be perfect, then it's not even worth it. And oh, I think absolutely. that's where the messiness comes from, and and all of that. It's like if it can't be this thing that I imagine in my head that in this crystalline perfect form, why even bother? Yeah, and I think Taurus is very. The, the, of the earth signs they're the ones that are very like you know they're perfectionists and they they won't give up until it's perfect mm-hmm. where virgos are very much like it's not perfect enough i didn't do it right the first time so it's just not worth doing yeah yeah so we did not get the politics question but i really want to ask you this i'm just going to do it because it's my podcast and no rules right? Absolutely, yeah um so you wrote about laverna for the yes. gorgon's guide to magical resistance and i loved yes. your your little snippet in there. And I was just thinking like, it was, I'm always fascinated by people who find these kind of obscure things to talk about. So I guess two questions, how did you get to Laverna and who else would you recommend to people to call on in these troubling political times, I guess? I, so um, I first discovered Laverna reading uh, Aradia, the gospel of the witches. 
And she is, for those who don't know, she is the Roman goddess of thieves and plagiarists. And um, I read, uh, was reading the Gospel of the Witches years and years ago. And there was just this little appendix in the back that had a story about Laverna. And she has only appeared in Roman myth and literature, like literally two or three times. Like she's mentioned in a play once and she was like on a, she was on a list of infernal deities somewhere in ancient Rome. Um, but she is very much a goddess of liberty and people whose activities um, take place in darkness, take place in darkness. So uh, she is the goddess of thieves, but also very much a witch goddess. And she was associated with Aradia. Um, and I just, I've always had a love of obscure deities in de- general. I like, I like finding gods and goddesses that, um, don't get as much of attention as they should and, um, and helping giving that and giving them that attention. If we wanted an obscure deity to call on in these times, in addition to Laverna, the first God who comes to mind is Nerides, who is the God of sea snails. And he's the Greek goddess of snails, but he was the lover of Poseidon. And um, he was uh, he was considered the most beautiful person in the world, the most beautiful of the gods. And um, Poseidon bragged about him a lot. And the story differs depending on who tells it. One story was that um, Poseidon bragged so much about um, his beauty, Nerides' beauty, that Aphrodite wanted him for herself. And when he rejected her, she turned him into a sea snail. Um, the other story is that Nerides was uh, Poseidon's charioteer, and Poseidon bragged that he was faster than even the sun. So Helios uh, challenged him to a race. Nerides lost, and um, <laughs> and Helios turned him into a, a sea snail. <laughs> sea, sea snail. I always feel like one thing about Greek myths is that there's different ways of like looking at the consequences, like with the myth of Arachne and Athena turning her into a spider, did she turn her into a spider as punishment or did she turn her into a spider because she was so good at weaving Athena didn't want her to have to do anything else except follow her bliss. And so, you know, Nerides was, he, did he turn, you know, did Aphrodite turn him into a sea snail so that he could stay in the sea with his lover? Did Helios uh, turn him into a sea snail to help him slow down because he was constantly rushing? Why not just, you know, why don't you just, you don't have to be the best at everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are there is a message with Nerides to um to slow down and to take care of ourselves first. But also Nerides and Poseidon had so much love together that they were able to have a child and whose name is Enteros, who is the uh god of requited love, where Eros is the god of unrequited love, and Enteros is, has always been the god of gay men and gay relationships. So at a time when LGBTQ lives are being legislated and people are debating our rights to exist, I think a um, a God of gay relationships who, by being male, but being able to give birth and then turning into a sea snail, which are hermaphroditic, is a very much a non-binary God. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's one who would uh, who would be worth calling on. And even prior to his mention in Greek myth, Nerides was... Um, a very popular God with sailors and seen as a very protective God. Yeah. So we've got a protective queer non-binary God who would be worth uh, giving a holler right now. Oh, I love that. A little, a little take care of, and a little message to take, put your, what is the cliche? Put your oxygen mask on first. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah put your oxygen mask on first before racing the sun. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Pepper, thank you so much for coming on. This was delightful. I had a blast. Thank you so much for having me. And um, like when your book comes out, let's let's do this again. Sounds I will great. let you know as soon as, as soon as I have a publication date, I will let you know. Awesome. Witch Lit is a production of Thousand Volt Press and is edited by Julian Rashke. Our intro music is Cosmic Glow by Andrew Kay, and our outro music is Voices by Alexander Shinekar. Transcripts and all our previous episodes are available at witchlitpod.com, and you can follow us on Instagram and threads at witchlitpod. Please help other witches find us by leaving a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening to and reading Witchlit. <laughs>